Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Melinda Harold Menzies. I'm a professor of environmental analysis and associate dean of faculty. Um, part of my job as associate dean of faculty is advising, and part is the implementation of the new educational objectives of social justice and intercultural understanding, which we'll be talking about um, today. Um, I will begin today by quickly um, going over our newly revised educational objectives. Um, and then I will briefly introduce our multidisciplinary panel of experts. Um, and then I will ask our, um, our faculty panelists um, to talk about their work and how their work intersects with these educational objectives. And then we will apply, um, I will ask them to apply their specialties to um, a specific real world problem. Um, we'd like to highlight how an interdisciplinary liberal arts education um, really addresses real world problems. Um, so first I'll begin by just going over very quickly um, our new educational objectives. Um, the college recently revised um, a few educational objectives to make them much more rigorous and to create courses um, for our students that would enable them to um, meet um, social justice requirements, social responsibility practices, and intercultural understanding requirements that are much more rigorous than anything that we had had before. Um, for social justice theory and social responsibility praxis, I know they're kind of, you know, a lot to say and you know, get out of your mouth. Um, we really want students to understand social justice issues that are related to race and ethnicity, class, sexual identity, um, sexual orientation, immigration status, nationality, um, and, and religion, and other different um, areas of difference. Um, we want students to be sensitive to ethical and political implications of social problems, structural discrimination, unequal distribution of power and resources, and the interdependence and intersection of systems of oppression. Um, we also want students to understand strategies to redress barriers of equality, or barriers to equality and inclusiveness. So it's, um, the, these are two objectives that are both theoretical in nature and also have a practical component in helping students understand ways of overcoming barriers, um, of putting into practice ways of dealing with systemic uh, discrimination. Um, for intercultural understanding, global and local, we want our students to learn about their own culture and place it in a comparative perspective. Um, we want students to be able to critically analyze their own, uh, their own cultural biases and describe how that affects their worldview. We also want students to be able to analyze important social issues from multicultural perspectives, to be able to step outside of their own ethnocentric um, perspectives and step into someone else's shoes. Uh, we want students to be able to engage with diverse groups of people, whether we are talking about groups within the United States or cultural groups outside the United States. Um, it's also essential that students understand how different forms of power, position, uh, positionality, and privilege uh, impact their own life circumstances and those of other, and that when we engage with others that we're very cognizant of our positionality and our, um, our power and privilege. Um, I'm now going to introduce our faculty panelists. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce them, and then they're going to talk about how their own research intersects with um, uh, social justice, social responsibility, and intercultural understanding. Um, Colin Robbins is a professor at Keck Science. He's a professor in environmental analysis. He reconstructs environmental change, landscape evolution, and plant ecology from the scientific study of soils and sediments. So yes, he does study dirt. He studies a lot of dirt. Um, he has degrees in geology and soil science, and also Spanish. Um, he's lived in Florida, Kansas, Minnesota, Oregon, Nevada, New York, and France. Um, he joined Pitzer College in um, 2012, and he enjoys listening to both classical music and melodic death metal. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is. Um, and then in the second chair to the left is Professor uh, Kibo Kili Dengu Zvobo. Zvobgo, um, I apologize. 27 years ago, um, we had a Scripps Pitzer program in Zimbabwe. 
um, the director of that program asked, came up to Kiba Kili and asked her if she would be a, a homestay, a host for a certain Pitzer student. Um, she said to Kiba Kili, I have a female student with a nose ring and purple hair. And I think you are the right person to host this student. Um, in Zimbabwe at that time, it was very unusual to have students or to see people with nose rings and purple hair. Um, and the director at the time was quite worried that um, other host families might really be uncomfortable with this pot smoking, mm, nose ring wearing, another <laughs> piercing wearing student. But she knew Kibo Kili could handle it. Um, and so Kibo Kili was the best homestay for her. And Kibo Kili opened up her home to this student um, with whom she's still um, friends, and the student still calls her mom. Um, and then um, Kibo Kili shortly thereafter ended up being the director of the Pitzer in Zimbabwe program. Um, she was there for 10 years um, before moving the program to Botswana in the middle of 2000. She came to Claremont in 2002, where um, she has been working in the study abroad office and teaching courses in gender and feminist studies. Um, uh, second to my, oh, I'm going to get the right and left wrong, sorry. That, that was not a political statement, apologize there. Um, uh, professor Rudy Talmor um, is an anthropologist and media studies professor and curator. Um, Rudy thinks about the many roles of art and other forms of cultural production and how they, they play in the world. She has lived in Tel Aviv, Caracas, New York, Accra, London, and Los Angeles, and has been at Pitzer since 2011. She loves playing solitaire on her phone while watching Candy Candy, the formative Japanese anime series of her childhood on YouTube, dubbed in the original Argentinian Spanish. <laughs> so if you want to learn to play, or you want to watch Candy Candy with her, check her out at her office hours. <laughs> and um, on my far right is Professor Michelle Berenfeld. Um, Michelle works on figuring out how people in the Roman Empire interacted with their surroundings and each other, particularly in cities in the Eastern Mediterranean. She has dug holes and or hiked for history in Turkey, Jordan, Greece, Egypt, and Tunisia. She came to Pitzer in 2010. She was a New Yorker for most of her life and is still adjusting to being a car owner. Uh, she's willing to see almost any movie that involves time travel, not too scary science fiction films, and selected superhero films. Um, so that's our multidisciplinary, multifaceted panel. And I'm going to begin with um, Professor Colin Robbins um, to talk, ha ask him to talk about his research and how it um, intersects with uh, uh, social justice and intercultural understanding. And I just want to remind you that he is a soil scientist. So I have no idea what on earth his work could have to do with <laughs> social justice. <laughs> or intercultural understanding, unless you, you know, speak to, to dirt, speak to soils. So ironically enough, I started out uh, in soils not interested in agriculture at all. And so most of my research before I came to Pitzer was entirely just looking at dirt for uh, geochemical code, basically information left by uh, past environments, past organisms, the traces of those climates and animals left in the dirt, left in the soil, either through um, their, their waste becoming nutrients that circles through the soil or through minerals that crystallize only in certain types of climates and environments. Um, but one of the things I guess I wanted to talk about, because I don't think my research is really quite where it needs to be in terms of engaging with a lot of the educational objectives that Pitzer has and that I share sort of uh, goals or aspirational goals, is that um, Pitzer's helped me grow my own research, my science, into uh, interconnections in a way that I had not anticipated doing. So. As a soil scientist, even though I didn't study agriculture, and even though I was studying minerals, and even though I got into geology in part to run away from people and imagine the planet <laughs> before we'd actually uh, shown up, um, what I find now, especially through my students and through my research, is that there are a lot of ways that I can connect uh, even the most academic research on soil minerals and deserts and landscape change to 
environmental issues. So if I study uh, <clears throat> palygorskite and sepulite, which are these fancy fibrous little clays that form with carbonate in desert soils, and all together are the reasons why desert soils are really hard and cemented, and all together are the reasons why if you want to, uh, I don't know, the joke is that the, the mafia often gets rid of folks in the desert, uh, but the shallow graves because it's a petrocalcic soil underneath that keeps them from digging. <laughs> Uh, so that's an intersection, but I don't try to do that. Um, but even if I study those minerals, they tell me about how the desert responded to past environmental changes. So oscillations from um, not glacial to interglacial, because it's a desert, and too dry, but from ice house to greenhouse, and from cooler and wetter to warmer and drier today. So those minerals tell me those stories, they tell me how the landscape responds, and in studying that, then I have a proxy that I can use to understand how about a third of Earth's population is going to be responding to climate change in arid and semi-arid and marginal landscapes around the planet. So in terms of uh, social justice, uh, praxis and theory, uh, social responsibility, uh, I think understanding the landscape around us is pivotal to societal sustainability and to personal wealth and value systems. If you, if you can't farm, if you can't feed your people, your civilization is going to collapse, which has happened multiple times, I'll let Michelle talk more about that. But, um, so, so very broadly, and uh, so social justice, there are lots of ways to connect my research to agriculture and to resources, even though that's not what I've historically done. So I'm looking forward to connecting those things that way. And then even though I'm a scientist, I also love connecting what I do to other avenues. So science is wonderful, because it engages us with our universe and keeps us curious. Um, but information just for information's sake is not all that valuable or not all that good necessarily. So it's exciting as a scientist to then turn information over to other people who may make policies or uh, move peoples around so that we can deal with changing resources in a changing climate. Uh, and then lastly, interdisciplinarity is one of those things that I love. Uh, my mom is an artist, and so I think just gaining an aesthetic appreciation for minerals, for learning how to take great pictures with an SEM, um, to publicize your research, to talk about how it's important, those are also goals that I have as a, as a researcher and a scientist. So. Thank you. Keep it going. Yes. Uh, Jose Ami, those people in, who work in my office have heard me use this term, Jose Ami. I walked into a bank and asked the bank manager for the tenth time why the money from Pizza College, Claremont, had not arrived in Hamroni a few years ago. And uh, he said, Hosiami. And the more I got aggravated, he said, Hosiami. <laughs> and I said, no, it's not Hosiami. All is not well. Help me here. I need money. I have 14 students to take around, blah, 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 the whole story. And uh, he said, Hosiami. And I learned my first lesson in Botswana that all is well, no big deal. Really, in the larger scheme of things, said the bank manager to me, you are well and I am well. Who cares about the money? <laughs> <laughs> so I went and talked to 14 students who were expecting checks, and I said to them, I told them exactly what I had learned that Hosiami, and the rest of that semester, we used Hosiami at every level. <laughs> we do study abroad at Pizza for intercultural understanding mainly, because we are all different. We uh, do this in order to understand the other. My main entry into this work comes through a passion for transnational feminism, which is what I am involved in. And sometimes here at Pizza, <coughs> I will teach a class on engaging difference, because I think that's a lot of fun when we learn about the other. My area of research is women and human rights in that intersection, and that fits in uh, so easily to our social justice and uh, intercultural understanding objective that we are pursuing and we're talking about. These uh, objectives have been here 
a while they just didn't arrive in the last couple of years but as melinda said in the last couple of years we really looked at them closely in order to see and ask ourselves why do we do what we do and uh, uh, on study abroad we focus largely on intercultural understanding and we do that in many forms we do language because because <laughs> language people need to learn language we do it through other forms like uh, we have a, a writing portfolio which sometimes we call the e-portfolio and then when electronic didn't, wasn't so cool we now call it the writing portfolio and uh, on our pizza programs we call it the field book but what that entails is a uh, a lot of writing where students process and learn a lot about different issues. I'll just give you a couple of examples, maybe one example. Um, we had a student that I worked with who wanted to understand women in Botswana specifically. And so in order to understand women in Botswana, she was a media studies student, and she, so she took pictures of these women uh, over a period of 10 weeks. And each week, she produced a picture and a story about a woman. But what I want to uh, emphasize is not just the assignment and the project, is that when she had uh, developed the pictures and written the little blurb at the bottom, she was able to present this to the person who had told her the story, saying, I am giving to you because it is your story and respect, which is what we are about, trying to not only understand the other, but move to a cultural competence that says, I can live and walk in your shoes. Uh, there are similar things like that that we do but I think I'll stop there for a moment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Rudy. Um, so just before I came here for this panel, I was teaching my perspectives on photography class, and we're currently reading a book, which is a completely interdisciplinary course that reads um, texts from a variety of different disciplines to try to understand photography and think about it in different ways, and we're currently reading Camera Indica, which is a book by an anthropologist named Christopher Pinney about photography in India, and we were discussing the first chapter, which is about the colonial uses of the medium. The second chapter, which we'll be discussing next time, is about how different communities and different people in India took control of the image and made it serve a whole variety of different purposes depending on their goals, um, their frameworks, their aspirations. So I start with that because in both my teaching and my research, which are something that Pitzer has really enabled to become quite enmeshed, I basically look at um, the social life of a thing or the social life of an image and the way that an image or a thing travels through time and across different contexts and uses and accrues all these layers of significance while retaining echoes of prior significations and how different communities and different individuals of people will kind of pull an object or an image down from this kind of ether that hangs over all of us and use it for very, very different things. So just as an example from my own work and the way that it intersects with Pitzer values, um, one of the community of artists that I've worked with very closely as an anthropologist since 2001 um, make tourist art in a post-colonial Ghanaian context for tourist audiences who are traveling to Ghana from abroad. And one of the objects that they make is a jambe drum, the goblet-shaped drum that comes from other parts of West Africa, not from Ghana, but which because of its circulation through global flows of world music, global flows of West African music specifically, and because of very specific trajectories and very specific pathways that that object has taken over time has come to 
transform drastically from what it originally was in its original places, um, which was a kind of ritual object for very specific uses and performances to what has now become a kind of globally recognizable icon of the continent of Africa and probably of a kind of global blackness more largely for certain people. And so in the project that I'm currently working on, I kind of trace out the different meanings that this drum has for different people in different places and different moments in time. So in that sense, it's a profoundly intercultural project. It's a project in which people from different cultural frameworks are constantly coming together in a shared space and bringing their own understandings to kind of butt up against the understandings of others and negotiating a new transformed understanding for objects and images out of that encounter. In order to understand that kind of process, my own work is very interdisciplinary. So as an, like anthropology itself is a profoundly interdisciplinary discipline depending on what kind of anthropology you do, in my case, um, I read media theory, I read art history, I read ethnomusicology, I read colonial history, I read in African studies, um, I read in visual culture. And so all of those kind of literatures and frameworks come to bear in my understanding of how that object has changed over time. Obviously in terms of social justice theory and social responsibility praxis, Contemporary anthropology thinks very much about the ethics of engagement. Um, and in my teaching, we, in my classes, we constantly talk about positionality, intersectionality, bias, the kind of today we were talking about how each of us brings cultural categories and lenses to bear that literally shape what we see and do not see in the world. And we're always talking about how both historically and today, both in places far away and in our own immediate um, locations, it is more and more important, but really always has been important to think in all of those ways. Thank you. Michelle. Hi, everyone. I know. I'm like, oh, that was so, I'm sure so <laughs> Well, I do. <laughs> um, obviously, Colin and I share a love of dirt um, and archaeology as well, so that's clearly an interdisciplinary connection right there. But um, as Ruchi was saying, archaeology is also an interdisciplinary field in itself. You work with material culture, art, some people do hard sciences, or they call people like Colin to come do it for them, in my case. Um, <laughs> But we, I think about history, religion, literature, art, politics, sociolo sociology, anthropology, all of those things participate in my research. I particularly am working now on looking at the later Roman Empire, a period when Christianity had become prominent but not yet total in its coverage of the Roman Empire, so to speak, and the relationships between the what we now call pagan, that is what everybody had been before, um, religions and Christianity and how people functioned in urban environments in uh, contexts where they were interacting all the time and shared a lot of cultural background but had this really stark difference emerging in how they thought about you know, the future and the past and their role in the universe. And so one of the things that's been very interesting for me to think about and I'm still grappling with is how in a world where physically the city itself looks quite similar to the way it did before, and these people, for instance, live in houses that look exactly the same, it's famously frustrating for us to not be able to figure out which is a pagan house and which is a Christian house in this period, but that itself is a really interesting statement of how difference and different cultural ideas are expressed in the world just because we have access to material culture we start to think that material culture is the main way to get access to information, or at least archaeologists do. And we realize that there's other things going on there that we can't necessarily see, or we have to figure out different ways of seeing them. So that's something I'm working on. I'll let you know how that goes. Um, but in terms of the broader, I mean, interdisciplinarity, I've said, but social justice is a really big factor in archaeology as i'm sure um, most of you know archaeology was basically born in alongside of colonialism and is perhaps the most 
flagrantly colonial project in academia at the moment still looks pretty colonial in a lot of ways. Um, and so the way that the production of knowledge about the past continues to affect our understanding of that past and how it has been manipulated for a long time. Everybody thought the Roman Empire was a great idea and that we should all be more like it. And those things still have repercussions in our world today. For instance, I've been working in North Africa and the Romans were also in North Africa and the French were also in North Africa. And the French very specifically said at some point, we're gonna go re-civilize North Africa like the Romans did, ignoring the whole part in between the Romans and them. And so Roman ruins in North Africa are now in the present world closely tied with French colonialism and an interest in them can be seen as a colonial interest, even though it is, but it's a different kind of, you know, this is a problematic thing when you think about, I'm interested in the Romans, I'm not trying to be the Romans, but, you know, this is a tie that you have to learn about and know about the history of that country in order to function there. Um, of course, we still struggle with what it means to do field work in other countries which have very different changing ideas about their connections with those pasts and how to do that ethically. The obvious ethical implications of archaeology is the stealing of people's cultural heritage and selling it and putting it in museums and all that kind of stuff. Um, but on the intercultural understanding side of things, this is something that came up when we were discussing this educational objective and I rather loudly kind of said, but what about the past? Because all of <laughs> our discussions were the, the now, you know, how do we now in, relate to the world outside of us? And how do we now re world in, relate to people in the US outside of us, whatever us means? And I feel very strongly and stated rather strongly, I must admit, that learning about the past is as much of an intercultural exercise mm -hmm. as anything else. And in fact, requires us to remember and encounter the fact that nothing that we think or see or feel <laughs> or understand has always been this way. Everything we have, you know, pretty much sexism is like the only thing that's universally <laughs> been around forever, but everything else, <laughs> um, you know, everything you see, every is you have assumptions about and you have to think about what what is beautiful, what a smile on someone's face means in ancient art is not the same as what it may mean to you now. And so you really have to come up against the notion that everything you think is somehow constructed and historically situated. And so I think that's a really valuable thing. And with the Romans, who I study, also being one of the most oppressive cultures in the history of the world, so that adds to the social justice factor. But um, with the Romans, we have this false familiarity with them. You know, we have a Senate. We have a republic um, for now. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. Some of you have been to toga parties shortly. And so, you know, we think we know them and we think that we understand them, but I think it's important to kind of look at their stuff and think about how they projected things uh, visually and literarily that we think we understand and maybe we don't. And this helps us, I hope, step back from those kinds of assumptions when you face false familiarities out in the world. I mean, let's face it, we are living in a globally hegemonic country. We speak a globally dominant language. Our world appears to have a very shared visual symbolic language, but it doesn't. And when you are consistently, you know, reinforcing the idea that you actually don't know what everything means when you see it and that maybe other people have other ideas, I think that's a good thing. Um, and my last point is that the Roman world, the Greek world, was inherently incredibly multicultural. It covered 40 modern countries. There were 100 million people living in the Roman world. They spoke thousands of languages, believed in hundreds of gods, fought and killed each other a lot, yes, but they also interacted and in, um, intersected in lots of ways that are interesting for us to learn about and to be able to see those changes over time, I think are really valuable. Hey, thank you. Um, the next thing that we'd like our panel to do is to address um, a common social problem and look at how they use their different specialties, their different disciplinary or interdisciplinary specialties um, to uh, address a really major uh, crisis that we have today. Um, we talked about looking at mass migration. Um, and when we think about mass migration today, there we have images of asylum seekers from Syria, Afghanistan, 
Afghanistan and Iraq. We have um, images of Mexicans that are fleeing something, um, whether or not they are fleeing something. There are constructed images of uh, a crisis in Mexican immigration. Um, there are immigrants from Central America who are fleeing um, a variety, or apparently fleeing a variety of um, different um, situations. Um, we look at refugees in um, South Sudan, um, refugees from famine in er various areas. Um, we're looking at um, climate refugees, the potential for climate refugees, um, political refugees, economic refugees, um, refugees in a number of different ways. So we thought we would talk about mass migration um, and how how, mass, how we look, might look at a problem of mass migration, and whether or not it's a problem, from our various um, specialties. Um, and, and looking at how, again, how an interdisciplinary liberal arts education really does prepare you for um, addressing, understanding, and, um, and creating solutions for um, real world problems. Um, so we're going to start from um, a slightly more general perspective, um, and then we'll close with something that's much more uh, specific pedagogical um, activities um, that we have our students engaged in. So I will again begin with um, Colin, um, because of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the one of the fun things that uh, earth science really does uh, transcend many disciplines and uh, it, it obviously occurs all around the earth and so uh, the cool thing about science too is it can also uh, cross cultures and it gets enriched by all the different cultures that it finds so very broadly uh, considering physical geography which is a, a course I Proud, I'm very glad to be able to teach here and uh, environmental science which I'm also very glad to be able to teach here um, a lot of mass migrations are, of course, driven by geopolitical problems, but most of those, I would argue, are tied to environmental resources, um, whether those be economic, or whether those be agricultural, or whether those be due to other things. So <clears throat> in recent history, um, we can think of just three broad examples. Uh, one, you can think of radiation after a tsunami takes out a nuclear power plant in Japan, and the thousands of people that um, are then displaced from that event. They have to be relocated. And those events force not only mass migrations, but they force a change in practice in terms of energy production. Um, we can take a look at the Maldives, uh, an archipelago mm -hmm. nation um, in the Indian Ocean, which average elevation above sea level, I think, is, is less than two meters overall. And most of the islands are much lower than that. And they were devastated, again, by, uh, by the 2004 tsunami. Um, and they are our world's future climate refugees. And that nation has taken, despite some political instability, some, some pretty good strides in the past to try to plan what they're gonna do when their nation basically goes extinct, when they lose their land. Um, so as a scientist, I, th I think very broadly, like understanding Earth systems and how they're connected, how they work, is again imperative for societal sustainability. But for interest in geopolitical stability, for integrating folks from different cultures, for dealing with the legacies of colonialism in places where uh, oil might be mm -hmm. vastly important. I think a lot of the issues that we see today are ultimately driven by, by those, kinds of, those kinds of questions. So to approach mass migrations without an understanding of the environmental questions or the scientific um, processes behind uh, the struggles to survive in certain places I think would be would be a problem. And so um, I don't yet engage with that fully in my research, but I have been attempting to encourage my students as much as possible to engage with those things in their own thesis research. And those are topics that I really look forward to discussing in, in all of my courses. So I'll pass on from there. Rudy, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so as I'll talk about anthropology and media studies, which are the two fields that I kind of bracket. As anthropology, in the way that it would look at mass migration, really in the way that it would look at anything, would try to kind of take a particular case or a particular form or a particular moment or occurrence and um, or practice and then connect it see it at the intersection of a whole bunch of different things that are happening. And so 
With a question like mass migration, there's a lot of, just in terms of the kind of literatures that I draw upon for my own work, um, people will look at questions of like how gender, local economies, questions of like generational position, and then questions of the circulation of possible life scripts or options through the circulation of media might all intersect to shape a particular mass migration. So just to give a couple of examples, there's a whole um, body of work within anthropology that looks at gendered migration and care work. And so, for example, if you look at um, kind of the domestic economies of many homes in Los Angeles for upper middle class women. You have a lot of upper middle class, predominantly white women who are working outside of the home who thus need to kind of outsource the care work of their children or their elders to other people. Those other people tend to be also women, but women of color who have crossed national boundaries from a lot of different places for a lot of different local economic reasons to kind of enter into these relationships. And so an example of a kind of anthropological look at mass migration would be to take the very intimate space of the home um, and see in the space of that home the kind of intersection of experiences of class, race, gender, um, national economies, you know, life scripts for what it means to be a proper woman, what it means to be a mother, what it means to you know, be a proper middle class subject, what it means to be a proper anything, and how all of those intersect with the like mass migration of many, many women from certain countries to other countries in order to kind of fill holes that are being produced locally within their arrival destinations. Um, another example that I a literature that I also draw upon is the literatures of tourism and kind of the circulation of media and how, if you can imagine, let's say, a young man in Accra, for example, to speak about my own work, who is born into a particular situation in which a particular life script of what proper adult masculinity looks like can no longer fulfill that script because of neoliberal changes to the local economy, but through a contact with tourists, meaning embodiments of other possibilities who are coming from without to visit the country, and also through encounters with images, through encounters with film or music or art or photography or television or commercials or print advertisements, might come up with a really radically different idea of what it means to be an adult male person in the world, and that might kind of spur inform, shape, or prevent a particular migration of a particular community from one place to another. So those are just two ways that both media studies and anthropology would be brought to bear upon um, particular migrations in which you would really try through a very close look at a particular community of people or a particular encounter between communities of people to kind of be able to pull out and look at all the different forces that are intersecting in those people's lives to shape the decisions that they're making around migration. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle. Um, well, you know, of course, people moved around a lot in the past. <laughs> 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 so everything, everybody did stuff in the past, too. Um, but many people, I don't focus on this in my research, but looking into the distant past, there are many instances of mass migrations and, you know, in the deep, you know, when we talk about deep time, not quite as deep as Collins, but pretty deep <laughs> nonetheless, um, where you see humans populating the earth, for instance, and where they went is a sort of big way of thinking about how humans do um, intersect with the environment. But in my world of the Greco-Roman Mediterranean, we have these pretty pronounced periods of people setting off either purposefully because they've decided to what we call now found colonies, which are colonies in a different way, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, the Phoenicians and the Greeks were moving around and resettling and changing their locations for many, many years. And the Romans, of course, marched themselves all over the place. Um, but people also were forced to move by 
um, geopolitical situations or military infiltrations, climate and environmental disaster. But one of the things that I think is important to remember, even though we can look at the past and see things like the material impacts of people moving and especially what makes societies resilient in those situations and what um, doesn't. But something I think about a lot now is the discussions of who belongs where in this mm -hmm. modern world. We're constantly talking, you know, these people mm -hmm. are from there. And to me, it all sounds kind of ridiculous. I have to tell, you know, it's like <laughs> nobody's from any of these places <laughs> originally. Like everybody's been moving all this time. And I know that's kind of an overly simplified radical way to, I don't mean that literally, but when we look at where people belong in the modern world, so much of those ideas are constructed through manipulations of ideas about the past, choosing particular points in history where we owned this place or we occupied it the best <laughs> at a certain point, um, when you can always keep looking farther and find more of movement and more differentiation. It doesn't mean people don't have a right to be where they are or where they move to, but I think it's important to remember that narratives about where people belong or who was the, supposed to be in a particular place are again, very much historically situated things. And you know, it's hard to look at them without, you know, I think it's important to at least view them critically in the intellectual sense. Um, and I think looking at the past helps us do that. Keep okay. it Yes, and uh, that's really an interesting segue to what we do because wherever the students, uh, our pizza students are located geographically, they find and have to deal with uh, situations of difference and uh, talking about migration and cross-border. We find that our students in Europe largely have the opportunity to study and work uh, in, with organizations that do um, work with refugees and work with new immigrants, helping them in our program in Italy to complete forms, to learn a little bit of Italian and become the cultural interlocutors uh, between uh, a people coming, say, from North Africa and the locals, and we find that in our program in Spain, we find our students doing work in, um, in domestic, uh, not our students doing work in domestic areas. Maybe that would be good too. But uh, <laughs> we have a lot of immigrants from Ecuador, and I think mm -hmm. in Sevilla, where we have our program, we have the largest uh, Ecuadorian population outside Ecuador, and mm -hmm. most of the people are in the service industry or in the domestic spaces, and our students work with them uh, in Spanish to assist where they can uh, with uh, all sorts of things by locking into existing organizations and they come and assist in that, uh, in that work. They are not always uh, assisting because that is a very problematic term and we make sure our students understand their role as guests in these lands and we, uh, our students also understand that they come with a lot of power that comes with going to a fancy American school uh, like this one and they bring American power and American privilege and so on and we problematize those on the ground so that they understand. And as our students work uh, and study abroad in certain locales, they are exposed to some real difficult conversations and we have, uh, as I said before when I uh, talked about the field book and the e-portfolio, we use those vehicles to push our students to that space where they will confront real difficult issues 
anticipating tomorrow's conversations on race, mm -hmm. we have a, uh, a nice question that I like in Botswana that uh, uh, asks students if uh, there's a quotation from Biko which says something like, and I paraphrase, uh, if you are white, you are part of the oppressor camp, period. That's Steve Biko, that's not me. And then we ask students who are white to address that question. Mm. What do you think? How do you feel about this? Evaluate it and from your perspective. Then we ask students who are of color, and I'm talking, when I say of color, I'm talking about black students. We ask black students to uh, look at that and address it, and already you'll ask me, then what happens? with the brown students in between. Uh, in Botswana, they are white. And they have mm. to confront that whiteness. And this is why mm. I find what you do very interesting in that we are not the same. We keep moving. And it's one thing to say here when we are in the class on engaging difference, on the identity section, we can say race is a social mm. construct, ha, 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 and it's easy to engage. But when they are in situation and they really realize mm. that this race is indeed a social construct, I thought I was a minority, I thought I was black, but I'm being labeled here as white. With all the privileges that that mm. takes, that becomes a very different conversation mm -hmm. when our students realize that. We also have an opportunity in all mm -hmm. of our programs, whether we're doing exchange programs in Oxford University, or we are doing uh, you know, a uh, pizza program in Nepal, we have the our students have the opportunity to do what we call directed independent study project, where they will, according to their disciplinary area, pursue that uh, interest. So again, if it's a student of media, they can pursue a media project. If it's a historian, they do a history project, archeology, span whatever, psychology. They pursue the projects that uh, they pursue a, an independent research that they want to do in an area of their interest, and they have a local knower who will help them navigate that knowledge space. And uh, I'd like just to add that what we find interesting is that that knowledge space and how they, uh, they learn is different from the way they learn here on our campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes it's not always in a classroom. Most often it's around a fire in a smoky little uh, kitchen in the back of beyond, or sometimes it's by the river as they fish and we give them these questions so that they are constantly asking themselves the questions and they are constantly realizing that they are the traveler. They are learning and filling uh, blanks where they didn't know and becoming really humble, which can't hurt a lot of our students <laughs> because traveling makes us all very modest because suddenly we realize that we do not know what there is to know and that what we've been told about other cultures is indeed not correct. Thank you. Um, um, as you can see, um, there are many different ways to look at, um, just in, amongst our group, to look at mass migration. Um, we see very simplistic narratives about mass migration on the news. Um, we, can we could build a multidisciplinary team um, of a geologist, um, an anthropologist, um, a gender uh, studies specialist, um, and an archaeologist, and a political scientist, and others to work together on looking at 
a specific case of mass migration to understand the um, deeper levels of why something is occurring, how it is occurring, um, what is the historic basis for this and what, what is actually happening. Um, and I think that's one of the powerful things that you get to think about um, in, in our classes. I also think that what um, faculty are doing and what they're thinking about doing um, just shows how much um, themes of social justice and intercultural understanding um, are embedded in the culture at the college and in, um, in our curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming.